for every one of these, you can, you can find an example uh, security exploits to take advantage of. Right? This is a convergent, typical buffer overflow that overflows an array or something the stack, and then as a clobbering return X. Uh, but for everything else, you can also find an example of it. And the problem here is there, there are so many of these things that can be clobbered. It's really tough to protect them all. Right? And uh, you know, they're all in the stack of the heap. And if you want to build a tool to try and prevent all these from being overwritten, you really have to watch everything. And uh, I'll talk about a tool later that does watch all of them. See there is significant overhead there. For a tool like this, our goal was to prevent security exploits at production server. Right? So you can't afford even a 2x load in this too much. So it's really not going to work to watch the data. But if you remember the second step of the attack, after you prep the data, it's usually sending control to the malicious code. So that's something that we can target. And usually what happens is the hardware interface is much wider than the ABI, the calling convention, and the typical execution. Okay, so if you write your program, you call foo, okay, and then foo returns to you. Right? But the hardware says, okay, let's return, let's just, it's a written instruction in x86, we'll go wherever the stored address says to go. Right? So the hardware is letting it do things the programmer never intended. So what we can do is we can use our software system here, where we're seeing everything that happens, so we're seeing all the branches. All the returns. And we can impose some constraints. We can try to really narrow the interface that the attacker can go after. So for every time we see a return, we can make sure that it's going after a call. Right? It should never go anywhere else. Except for certain exceptions and some weird programs. Okay, so that's the basics of, of uh, a technique we call program shepherding. Right? It's turned into a startup company. Uh, it was pretty successful. Ended up being acquired by VMware. And uh, even though we're letting the data be corrupted, uh, we're not going to let the attacker run malicious code. Right? So they, they, you know, they, they could end up doing a uh, service type of attack or something, or maybe crash the program. But they're not going to go uh, run malicious system calls and make permanent damage. Okay, so that's the security example. Uh, the other example I'm going to talk about. Part of a development tool. And this is going after memory limits. So, how many people here have used Valve? Okay, so this is a very, very similar type of tool. Uh, but I don't need to go into the background. You know, it's really targeting memory products, usually in C or C++ programs, right? Where it's, it's common to have errors. You know, like double free, uh, use after free. And these kinds of errors are very difficult to detect. Just uh, you know, go and write your test suite, and you see some weird crash. Usually, if it's a memory error, it often happened long before the observable symptom. Right? So you have to track backward, and sometimes it ends up being non deterministic because it depends on some uninitialized memory value, things like that. Right? So it's a pretty tough track down, and you really want some kind of dedicated tool. So, my tool is called Dr. Memory, and it's, it's finding uh, like unaddressable memory accesses. So this is whenever the program reads or writes a memory location that was not uh, legitimately allocated. Right? So if, let's say it calls malloc and then it tries to read a malloc header or something. That's for me an unaddressable access. So it's more than just what pages are about. And uh, this one of finding uh, except for free. So if you free a piece of memory, I'm not going to reallocate it for a long time. And I consider it unaddressable. So if anyone touches it, you're going to see that access. Right? It's also going to find a read of memory that has not been written to since it was out. So it's an uninitialized memory read. And memory leaks. So if you're familiar with Valgrind, this is a pretty similar uh, set of features. Uh, mine works on Windows as well. And the way you implement something like this is you're going to have to monitor all the memory accesses the application makes. You're going to have to record something about the state of every piece of memory. Right? Is it okay to read? Is it okay to, to write? And uh, you know, in addition to all the loads in store, there's just quite a bit to 
monitor. We have to look at all things that outgate memory, library calls, system calls, uh, even just changing the stack block. That's going to affect what's uh, legitimately okay to access. If it's impossible with this speed, how much, how much memory in the record is this in program? You know, the kind of Docker memory tool take? Yeah, like a memory tool as well as the whole data. Uh, I don't know what slides in here about that. I have them in a different time. It, it allocates it lazily. So it's got to be proportional to the amount of memory the program is accessing. And the most compact mode is going to use, uh, it's going to be four to one. So one quarter of the application's memory is going to be used by the shadow state. So if you've got an application, let's say you're in a 32-bit edge space and you're using all the memory already, the tool might not fit. But it's rarely a problem in practice. And uh, so I talked about tracking the state of memory. So let's say you're doing byte regularities. For every byte of memory, each byte will be one of these three states, right? And it's unaddressable, so it has not been allocated yet, right? It's been allocated, but not written, it's initialized, or it's fully defined. Okay, so whenever you monitor a load or a store, you just look at what state that's in, and you can decide whether it's an error. And when there's an allocation, depending on the type of it, like an MMAP is going to be easy to remember, you're going to move the state, right, over to the state that you get the allocation, and you go back to the interface. So those are the basics, right? You're shattering all memory, and you're monitoring all the memory operations. Right, so that's a, a lot of uh, monitoring here. And you end up with pictures like this. So here's the original application stack. Going down, there's a stack pointer. So beyond the top of the stack is all unaddressable. Right? Within your stack frame, some of them might be defined, you've written to it, but it's going to start out in uh, Here's some heat. So here's a, a malloc that you call, and that's going to start out initialized, and then you write to it and define the header. Uh, the tool considers uh, adding to be an unaddressable. And we've got a free block down here. Okay. And uh, as you can imagine, doing all of this uh, instrumentation, you know, every memory operation, you're checking these states, is a pretty significant overhead. Uh, my tool has managed to get the overhead down to about half of a Valgrind, which is the state of the art uh, in terms. So these are some numbers on uh, back to the six. This is a Linux where Valgrin works so we can compare the two. And so Valgrin is about a 20x slowdown on average. And uh, the Dr. Memory tool is about a 10x, so about twice as fast. But plus you run more test suites. Because usually you get it. How much more, fav uh, how much more favorable is Valgrin if you take out the tests where Valgrin fail? Like, are they starting to be zeros? I didn't count those in the end. Uh, Alright, so that's, that's my second good tool example. So now I'm going to look at the history of the project. So there was this tool called Dynamo, and I think the pattern, where they were trying to optimize an already compiled and optimized by the compiler binary, which is on PA risk. And they actually succeeded in speeding up some programs, which the conventional wisdom of the time was you could never do that. I already optimized it, having something at one time, you've got overhead of analyzing it, but they were able to do it. One reason is Peter is to be very good in their branch. Uh, so they switched to x86, uh, less success there. And at the time, the people on the Dynamo team, they all had IBM. Right? So soon after they literally started the code base fresh and, and targeting x86, so then they all left. Right? So I was at MIT and I grew we call it real, you know, runtime introspection and optimization. Right? We're building these tools. And we ended up, we wanted to use their system. And so we made an agreement with Hewlett Packard to use it at MIT. Right? And they all left, so we essentially took it over. Mostly rewrote most of it. And that's where the name came from. Right? Hewlett Packard demanded that Dynamo be included in the name, and we like the real name, so you end up with Dynamo Real. Yeah, I have regret keeping that in now. It's, it's a little too weird, but uh, that's what happened. And uh, so at MIT, we tried to do optimization for the next 86. 
the x86 hardware was a lot better than the Toyota's hardware, so we didn't have too much success. We switched to other tools, uh, including the security idea that I described. That turned into a startup company. Now, while we were at MIT, we wanted to release this as a tool platform. And because of the Hewlett Packard uh, agreement that we had, we couldn't give out this option. Right? But we did get them to agree to let us give out a binary release. So, essentially, the release was a shared library with an API that you can write your tool to target that API. Right? So, for many years, we were putting out binary releases. Uh, our startup was acquired by VMware. Uh, within VMware, I managed to convince them to open source the Daimler Eagle platform. Right, so that happened in early 2009 with a BSD license. Okay. So from that point on, it was all open source. And uh, I started working with Dr. Memory about that time. Uh, Google was interested in that. I with Google. And uh, that's where things stand today. Uh, it's always been a small team that's been working on it. Uh, at MIT, we had a handful of grad students. At the startup, the core team working on the Dynamo system, we eventually got six. Right? And we had a few dedicated QA at the startup. Uh, VMware has kind of shrunk a bit. Uh, we've done about two people really maintaining the system. At Google, we've got a couple more, but we're definitely looking for what we can contribute, trying to grow the project. Uh, when I open sourced it, put it on Google Code, uh, and it's a BSD license. Uh, the whole uh, code base is about 300,000 lines of code. You guys are all large. Mostly C code, a little bit of assembly, it's a very low level system. And uh, in Google Groups for a discussion forum and mailing list. And uh, this is the URL, easy to remember. And Dr. Memory also is open sourced separately. Uh, it's got an LGPL license. Uh, I started it in VMware, and that's the license I wanted to use. Uh, it's about 67,000 lines of code. It's also on Google Code, using a similar setup. And if any of you are interested, uh, you're definitely looking for people to contribute. Uh, if you wanted to build a tool, there are all kinds of things you can build. I'm interested in security, maybe a fuzzer, uh, a sandbox, random malware, that's interesting. Or just anything simple, you know, code coverage tool. It's very easy with a dynamic system like this, right? You're seeing all the code that ran, and it's done. Uh, you can contribute to an existing tool, uh, which I've talked about, and there are a few other older tools that we wouldn't mind bringing back to life. Uh, you can build a tool library that other tool writers could use. And uh, you can jump to the underlying platform. There's a big project here if you're interested uh, in your Mac expert who would like to get a Mac OS for a uh, number of large projects. All right, well, that's it. Uh, thank you. Thank you. 